Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. AMD's Computex event. It was quite something, wasn't it? The highlight, as I'm sure many of you know by now, was a 16-core engineering sample Zen 4 processor hitting 5.5 gigahertz in game workloads and absolutely decimating, annihilating, destroying, and stomping not only AMD's own previous generation of processors, but also the 12900K, with a small asterisk, which we'll get into in just a moment. But there were also a ton of details which were not discussed in the event, not least of which RDNA a free and we're going to be discussing that predominantly in this video and we're going to get right into it after this message from the video sponsor if you're running a copy of Windows 10, which isn't activated, of course, not only do you have to worry about the missing customization options, but there's also that annoying Windows desktop watermark reminding you to activate. Today's video is sponsored by whokeys.com, and they have an excellent price on Windows 10 Professional as well as Home Keys. Yeah, and they also, of course, sell games. I've bought a few Windows 10 keys with my own personal account to test everything was legit and worked in preparation for this sponsored video. You can pick up one of their keys for 25% off using the coupon code RGT in the checkout. There's links to their website in the video description. Also, if you're building a few systems, there's bundles available too. Again, you can check out whokeys.com and use the coupon code RGT for 25% off the listed Windows 10 key prices. I'm going to quickly go over some of the interesting stuff for the Ryzen 7000 series, but ultimately i think many of you guys have probably seen it already so i want to focus on things that were not necessarily discussed and some of the things that i've personally been hearing from my own sources as i perhaps find the silence on certain things perhaps more telling them the things that they've been more boastful about but anyway let's just quickly go over the highlights so the um, sample that they shown off was 16 core process. Now, I still believe that this is the top flagship SKU. Some of my sources are still telling me that there are higher core count processors which do exist for the Zen 4 lineup, but at this stage, I don't believe that that is the case. I think that the highest flagship is going to still be 16 cores. Zen 5, though, does apparently go up to 32 cores, 64 threads. Um, now, there is, of course, the heterogeneous, big, little, whatever you want to say, architecture for Zen 5. I'm kind of going a little bit off track here, but I just want to clarify this. But I don't believe that the small cores, which are based on Zen 4's architecture, would be present on high-performance desktop chips. So that, would, of course, would be like, you know, thread rippers or high-end Ryzen CPUs, which would be the replacement or the Zen 5 equivalent of, like, the 5950X. But anyway, so... For Zen 4, then, it seems that we're going to top out at 16 cores. Again, a couple of my sources have told me that it could go higher, but personally, I don't believe that this is the case anymore. Although, I do believe that it's very likely, according to what I'm hearing from multiple people, and I think it was Grayman or Kopity 7 Kimmy, I don't remember who said this, so I don't want to miscredit. I can't honestly remember. I did do some digging, but I, can't, I couldn't find the tweet. Um, but they also said the same thing, and that is that Ryzen Vcash variants of Zen 4 will release. Now, I think that this is going to be much later. Probably, you know, some point next year, it's going to be kind of a refresh, you know, and probably when Intel get closer to launching their 14th generation. As we all know, the 13th generation, which is Raptor Lake, is going to launch later this year, and it's going to face off against Zen 4 or Ryzen 7000 series. And there were a plethora of things which were discussed. AMD gave kind of a very high-level overview of of the processor architecture, but they didn't really give too many specifics. Again, they gave 5.5 gigahertz as the clock frequency, which was achieved during game workloads. And this is very important because game workloads are not necessarily what, they're not necessarily the same thing as let's say you're running Blender or you're exporting a video in Adobe Premiere. You guys get the idea. For IPC claims, well, AMD have made no claims at all. They've simply said that they have achieved above a 15% gain in single thread performance. But, yeah, no IPC information, and benchmarks themselves were really thin on the ground. They didn't give a ton of numbers, and that's putting it mildly. So, I have previously said that I was hearing around a 20% gain over Zen 3 was achieved with Zen 4, but... Interestingly, over the weekend, I was actually told by a source that they actually achieved less than that, or at least it's lower than expected. The thing is, though, 
there is so much um, conflicting information for Zen 4 as well as RDNA 3, it's quite difficult to know. It's very possible, though, that I think AMD are sandbagging here with their results, and I don't think we're going to really know what the chips are capable of until closer to launch. Again, because of the ultra-fast clocks, though, that the Ryzen 7000 series is hitting, it may not matter too much for them to compete against Raptor Lake. This may make some level of sense, though, because in multiple videos at this point, you probably remember that I heard that, you know, Zen 4 was basically described to me as fat Zen 3. Basically, it takes what's good about Zen 3 and just turns it up to 11, whereas Zen 5 is the major architectural shift. Again, it's going to be very interesting to see how all of this plays out, especially against Raptor Lake. Now, before we get into the Cinebench runs themselves, or rather the numbers, I want to be very abundantly clear here. These are very early numbers. These are engineering samples, and therefore the numbers could go higher, or for that matter, lower. And again, I've only had these numbers from a single source. But also, let's get some context. So let's use the website CG Director real quick. Looking at the results for the 5950X, we can see that single core is achieving around 1700 points and 29,000 for multi. Obviously, your mileage will vary based upon what memory you've got and yada, yada, yada. The 12900K, meanwhile, is hitting around 2000 and 27,500, respective for single and multi thread. So if we compare that here to the results that I've been getting, which again, I want to stress are being rounded up and down, around 39,000 is being achieved with the 16 core version of this processor, um, which is pretty decent. It's a pretty decent leap over the 5950X. And the single core result that I've been hearing is around 2100 to 2400 points. Now, that does seem to depend upon multiple things in terms of the configuration. So I'm going to just say an average here of 20, let's say that the 16 core is getting 23, 2400 points. It means that almost certainly, if these numbers are accurate anyway, the 13900K for content creation anyway, is going to be really impressive because remember, it does have those additional cores. The 12 core sample here though is scoring around 29,000 points. So that's still relatively impressive, but again, because Intel are going to be increasing their core counts anyway, it's going to be very interesting to see how all of this plays out. Ultimately speaking, um, Zen 4 I think is going to be very impressive. I feel that AMD are going to really hit the ticks it needs to. The main problem with Zen 4 is the price of DDR5 memory, as most of you know. Ultimately, there is no DDR4 variant. You guys have probably seen all the motherboard stuff, and you can see the slides on screen yourself anyway. But yeah, no DDR4 support, which is not surprising. You know, I've said this for months. Multiple other people have said this for months, that there is no DDR4 support with... Ryzen 7000 series, and this is for multiple different reasons, not least of which, of course, because of the high performance uh, APUs that they want to release. And ultimately, AMD want to build like a forward facing platform. This does give, technically speaking, Raptor Lake perhaps, I, want, I don't want to say an advantage, but it does give people who have like 32 or 64 gigabytes of high end DDR4 memory, perhaps some pause. But as always with this stuff, like, it's kind of down to you, right? I mean, we can make a very good argument that if you have eyes on, let's say, one of the lower end Ryzen uh, SKUs, like the six cores, maybe if you have like a DDR4 set of memory, which is really fast, and you have quite a limited budget, maybe Intel would be the way to go. But ultimately, until we see A, the pricing of the SKUs, pricing of the motherboards, and finally the performance results, all of this is kind of like up in the air. Now I want to shift focus to RDNA 3, and I know that I'm jumping around here a lot, but there's a lot to talk about, guys, and yeah. Um, RDNA 3, <laughs> it was a no-show. Um, I'm surprised about that. I had originally been told that they were going to be discussing it, but not super deep. There was not going to be an architecture dive. In fact, I tweeted about this yesterday. I didn't think they were going to be going into architecture. I thought at best they may give a mention of it and kind of do, I don't know, well, maybe you guys weren't into it back then, but if you recall back in the day um, of when AMD were demoing um, Polaris or uh, 
there you go um you remember how they kind of did it where they showed like a and we are also showing so it's kind of like not really any performance data maybe like an on-screen um kind of frame rate counter but because you didn't know what necessarily was going on in the game like you didn't know the rest of the configuration it was very difficult to ascertain performance um i thought they may do that with a brief summary of like rdna3 is still on track but there was absolutely nothing and quite frankly i am not surprised by this the main reason honestly is just that AMD don't want to give away anything right now for A, and B, they've just launched the refresh of RDNA 2. So, well, obviously, they don't want to scupper the sales of that, but mostly it's got to do with NVIDIA. And both of these companies are playing 3D chess. Like, you know, it's it really is a game of brinksmanship. And I'm sure most of you know that RDNA 3, you know, has multiple different SKUs. And the rumor has it, and this is what I'm hearing, Zen 4 and Navi 33 launch first, and then... 31 launches later this year and then 32 launches next year perhaps around the same time maybe a little later than phoenix whereas rtx 40 is allegedly going to launch in july now quite honestly all of these companies are changing timelines all of the time it wasn't too long ago that we were hearing that the rtx 4090 was going to be like the full you know fully enabled SKU essentially and it's going to be under 600 it's going to be like 600 watts but now apparently this is going to be the 4090 ti and the reason is it because nvidia are adjusting its lineup this is a guess this is not based upon what my sources are telling me so i could be totally off base here my guess is though that NVIDIA want to hold back specific SKUs and give themselves additional flexibility for when in, uh, AMD start to release their stuff. Because if NVIDIA goes first, it doesn't want to put like its its flagship out because that gives AMD a lot more ab ability to kind of tweak prices and that type of thing. Now again, NVIDIA can't be like, well, you know what, we're going to just like add a whole bunch of additional SMs to the system. They can't do that and not, neither can AMD. They can't tweak the lineup like that. But what they could do is in the low to mid range or high range, they could be like, okay, well, what we're going to do is that the 4070, we we're going to have X number of SMs with this. But hey, these cards from AMD are looking kind of good. So we're going to actually juggle it and maybe add a few additional SMs, you know, kind of bin it differently. It will be very interesting to see how all of that plays out, to be honest with you. So then what about RDNA 3's specifications? Well, at this stage, I am pretty positive that we are looking at a single GCD. This is something that I've discussed on the channel multiple times. In fact, I think I was the first person who said it was a single GCD, at least to my knowledge. Now, Grayman, Kopi 7 Kimmy, and others are saying much the same. And I believe that the fully enabled SKU is 48 work group processors. So this is around 12,000. I'm just gonna round up and down for everyone's sanities shaders. Now it does support, to my understanding at this stage, it does support VLIW2. I've heard mixed things about this and I've discussed VLIW2 previously in uh, you know another video. But yeah, I think it does have VLIW2 to support for rdna3 and how i think it works speaking to multiple people is basically let's say you have two shaders or alus however you want to say it um and they basically are working on an instruction so let's say shader one let's just make this really simple let's say shader one is working on a result which is one plus one so obviously one plus one is two but let's say shader two requires the result that shader um that, sorry alu1 just ran so it needs for that math to work it needs uh it needs um it needs the one plus one result and then shader two needs to add that result which is a two to whatever else normally it would have to go through caches and stuff like that to my understanding with how amd have implemented with this it doesn't which should reduce you know penalties and bandwidth and stuff like that ultimately speaking though this is not confirmed that it supports this is this is like rumors from drivers and what i'm personally hearing i would personally you know at this stage there is so many conflicting pieces of information with rdna3 however i do believe that we're looking at around 12,000 shaders i think that the performance targets so are still going to be just over two times around 2.3 2.4 is probably my guess in terms of raster performance on the top end i would love to be wrong i'd love for it to be like 20 times but obviously that's just not realistic 
Ray tracing performance though, I think there's a lot more room. Now, as for the skews themselves, well, this is basically what I'm hearing for Navi 31, 32, and 33. And you can see the specifications. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to probably go a deeper dive in the not too distant future. But this is what I think the specifications of them are. And you can see that basically we're looking at a 384 bit bus for N31. And the Infinity Cache, I've been told by multiple people, is 384 megabytes. I've also had a couple that tell me it's 192. I don't know which is right. At the moment, I'm leaning towards 384 megabytes of total cache, but I could be wrong, ultimately. You know, these are all rumors. N32, um, 256-bit uh, memory bar, so obviously you can see the shaders are cut down. And finally, N33, which is on monolithic die and... Um, it should still perform pretty admirably. Yeah, I think that's just about it for this video. I think I've covered pretty much everything I wanted to. Um, I know there's going to be a lot of extra stuff over the you know following months, like obviously as we get closer to the launch of all of these different products, we're going to start to see some benchmarks, and I'm really interested. Um, I feel that this generation of products perhaps has more hype for me even than RTX 30, which had a lot of hype in RDNA 2, because, like, the performance leaps are so much more. I mean, just for example, with NVIDIA, it seems that we're looking at at least a two times increase over RTX 1390, and it's probably going to be more like 2.2, 2.4 times for the 1490 Ti, or whatever it ends up being called. For all we know, it could be called Dirty Socks, I don't know. Um, and honestly, that is pretty damn good, which fills me with excitement for the high end, but even more so for the mid range. And I know I keep mentioning the mid range every single damn time, but I, I have a dream that we can actually have like achievable 4k outputs with ray tracing enabled either with DLSS or FSR fine, because why not if the quality doesn't really, you know, degrade too much um for mid-range and i would love that that would be amazing to me so that's that's what i really want and i think amd nvidia you know all of these companies that's the ultimate goal like with amd for example i think that the mid-range is going to essentially be like 1440p you know with all the bells and whistles ultra high frame rate or 4k decent gaming with perhaps some some you know some of the ray tracing disabled but the, the high end is going to be like you know 4K or 8K being quite achievable, especially again with like DLSS or FSR or XCSS, assuming it ever bloody launches at this stage. And of course, AMD and uh, Intel are both going to be pushing the iGPUs and Phoenix is going to be really powerful. Again, you know, just to repeat myself, it's going to be roughly on par with a 3050, 3060M, which I'm okay with. Like that's 1080p, baby. And I think that kind of rocks. So I think APUs of the future are going to be pretty sweet. Um, one, one tiny little thing before I close out. Um, I will be covering more about the PlayStation 5 Pro and some other bits later on in the week. I uh, actually have started writing scripts and doing some research on that. Uh, the video has been a little bit delayed just because of real life stuff's been a bit manic recently but um yeah normal production should start to happen in the next couple of days so basically speaking that will be up soon but take care of yourselves have an amazing day bye for now